I think, quite a visible development and change in perception of uh, research and innovation at uh, EU level uh, with the Horizon Europe program, but also with uh, an increasing visible, sometimes rather central role, uh, which member states are assigning to research and innovation in the uh, strategies and plans to um, exit uh, from the present um, pandemic and uh, social and economic uh, crisis to build a more resilient um, a society, a more resilient Europe, whilst, of course, at the same time, uh, remaining as ambitious than ever against the urgency to transform our societies, to be green, and uh, also to ensure that at the end of the decade, we can genuinely speak of a digital Europe. Uh, at, um, in the Commission, uh, research and innovation is um, if you want, at the heart of uh, policy making uh, across all EU policies, uh, uh, Commission services, uh, not only DG Research and Innovation, uh, also the Joint Research Centre, and many other DGs which are well connected to research and innovation, are using um, research knowledge, research results, technologies which are emerging uh, from uh, research funding, to provide and design better policies which can deal with this recovery and these transformations. So there is um, a, a very strong momentum to beyond uh, the work we've been doing successfully over the last decade, and, and the four panelists, I think, uh, will certainly be able to illustrate it very well, beyond the progress we have made on intensifying research, on creating uh, better connections between, between academia and society and industry, uh, putting in place um, accelerators um, and incubators across uh, all the European Union, around universities, regions, industries. We are now looking increasingly at the direction which all uh, this work takes, and therefore uh, research valorization uh, with a clear direction towards sustaining these transformations and in the present circumstances, uh, ensuring a resilient recovery, uh, one which really leads us into the future. So the traditional questions around uh, knowledge valorization are still very much there. They are, of course, much impacted uh, by um, the drive towards open science. The open science cloud is really now uh, coming together. Uh, in the context of COVID-19, uh, the, the data and research uh, platform uh, uh, against COVID-19 operated by EMBL um, uh, with the European Commission is an amazing success with more than a million of uh, genome sequences of the virus uh, uploaded with tens of thousands of unique users using the platform. And uh, I think we can, we can say that this platform really has been a, a, a driver uh, to accelerate um, responses to the pandemic. And I think is a spectacular uh, illustration of how, how open uh, data, uh, uh, open science, and to an extent open innovation are now becoming a reality, um, allowing us to accelerate um, the deployment of our research in, um, in uh, health, in this case, in therapeutics, of course, particularly vaccines, as we all know. And therefore, you are making, um, as uh, researchers and innovators, increasingly a deep difference. I will be. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be short, so I will stop here. I could also continue um, with a, a lot of further work which was done during the crisis, including by Peter's teams, including by the European Innovation Council. There is a lot, I think, during this crisis um, which demonstrates that open innovation, open science is making a deep difference to uh, re research valorization and with it allowing research to really make a difference uh, for our societies. Now, um, let's see how our panelists um, uh, see that, uh, what uh, lessons they uh, will be able to draw together now in the next um, uh, in the next 15 minutes. I must say I'm very much uh, looking forward to it. Uh, and we will uh, start, uh, Sasha, uh, with you, um, with the perspective of names in Russia and Bulgaria. Sasha, over to you for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, jean -Eric. And uh, I'm happy to be part of this uh, this dialogue. Uh, 
Um, of course, we all are champions of innovation and are contributing in different way to the innovation process. You invited me to speak uh, in my capacity of uh, angel investor, uh, but also as someone that uh, is supporting a lot the grassroots innovation process in Bulgaria and to European level. And um, I remember in 2018, uh, when we've been hosting uh, the RNI Tour Europe um, here in Bulgaria, in my country, uh, where open innovation, open science, those has been terms uh, that we discussed in a quite boutique uh, way, honestly, uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, in that time still to some extent today, um, the research centers uh, tend to operate uh, in the old way, quite local, in close communities, in close environments. Of course, uh, uh, the pandemic changed a little bit uh, this process, and we we'll have a chance, as I know, to talk about uh, uh, more later on uh, during the discussion. Uh, and I see much bigger readiness today to explore and give a chance to those uh, to those alternatives, not only on platforms, but uh, is done on European level, but also the researchers, the different stakeholders in the uh, innovation process to take advantage of what Europe uh, has as a big, big asset uh, and to translate it into a potential uh, for business and for competitiveness. Uh, what I want to stress on is uh, another dimension, that there are other pockets of innovation that we also need to look at. And those are the uh, co-workings, the communities for exchange, uh, the grassroots generated platforms for co-creation, where even 14 years old uh, share their breakthrough ideas and meet uh, in a natural way their co-pilots uh, for innovation. And this is the grassroots civic innovation process, which is, of course, much more difficult way to put in policies. Uh, so here is, uh, in my view, the challenge uh, for the future that we need to, uh, to tackle. And of course, uh, what has been created with the whole um, Horizon Europe program it's amazing, amazing opportunity and background uh, for we to invite also, also those guys that uh, normally are not uh, waking up and pressing on the uh, EU um, uh, web page to see uh, uh, what are the availabilities for them. But uh, I'm stressing on uh, this uh, most probably not uh, well attended or enough attended and not so much uh, understood uh, uh, part of the uh, innovation ecosystem because those are the guys that uh, carry the power to trace the national and the European economy for the years ahead. And I will just illustrate with one example where I am involved. A few months ago, uh, six uh, uh, startups, six founders uh, uh, created the uh, Green Tech Alliance. That's an entirely grassroots initiative that is inviting the startup from throughout the world uh, that are active in the green tech field, which is, of course, also on our agenda, uh, uh, quite close uh, for the climate change. But uh, uh, let's look into how they position themselves. They said our motto is purpose before profit. And they don't look for money at first instance. What they created was a community that invites everybody who is green tech founder. And they also invited people like me uh, that can help them to uh, grow faster in a natural way, with no money, with no programs, with no uh, the special protection, if you want. And they have uh, top media uh, specialists, business people, researchers, of course. Uh, and uh, through a simple Slack channel, they created a midpoint for those uh, 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 who needs support in innovation and in science and for those who can uh, deliver it. A month back or even less than a month, same guys created a petition, an initiative that they are packaging for European Union that is uh, called uh, Let's 2021 Counts. 
and uh, uh, they request European Union to put policies to stop greenwashing. So why I'm telling you what is this story in, is uh, to look from a little bit different angle because a lot has been done already uh, for Horizon Europe and Jean-Eric Paquet uh, uh, just uh, framed many, many excellent initiatives uh, that has been done. But uh, we should be sensitive that we are not only incubating those guys, that we should have those guys together with us on the table because they know things that we eventually don't know. And uh, the challenge that we need to tackle is how we can engage uh, in a very practical way with this most vital part of the economic and uh, scientists to be players and also to secure uh, their timely uh, success because uh, uh, that's where the future is. Uh, that's, uh, uh, they are also those uh, uh, saying we know things and we request from you. So uh, I, uh, uh, I think that uh, um, speaking about valorization, we should uh, have in mind also this part, and uh, uh, I want to close with three topics where that we should maybe. Can I ask you to come back with the three topics afterwards? Because in principle, you had one minute, and if I want to go through the oh, panel, okay. I'm going to be now quite challenged. I, I, I think you didn't know it was one minute only. I, I, uh, maybe, it maybe. It was maybe. so rich that I didn't want to stop you, but now I will, uh, and we'll come back to we'll come back to it. Um, sure. Say, sorry. Uh, Sorry, I thought I'd no, have three minutes, and that's why no, I... You had uh, one. You had one. You okay, had one. sorry had about one. this. Okay, thank no, you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. This was very rich, and um, I must say the, 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 the need also for this bottom-up work and seeing, indeed, uh, young innovators, um, in this case in Bulgaria, uh, around a green tech alliance, I think is an amazing development and one which, indeed, we need to listen to. There's no doubt about that. I think the real challenge that will come from through our discussions is certainly also how we can connect the various levels and the various instruments. And this is where you and your other okay. panelists are so important. So thanks, Sasha. I, I move to Miko uh, for your uh, opening statement of one minute. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be invited to this panel. So thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm uh, running the uh, Innovation uh, Policy Division in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment in Finland. And um, uh, we have a lot going on, but uh, if I state only three main things, uh, we are running the research and innovation program, which aims to reach the 4% GDP level of R&D investment in Finland. And this is uh, at the moment negotiated in the Finnish uh, government and also parliament. So basically we are seeking to a very large commitment to this goal. Then we have IPR, IPR strategy, and uh, we are preparing a new strategy. We did one before in the year 2009. And I was told by my staff that I must advertise that in the World Economic Forum competitiveness analysis, Finland is number one in this area. So, so therefore, here's a piece of ad, uh, advertisement. And then the third one is the uh, Corona or COVID compensation force, which we are creating. So we are compensating the companies of the losses and also event organizers. And, and, and this is something that is going on currently. Uh, finally, I might uh, 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 go down the memory lane a bit because uh, in 12, uh, uh, sorry, in 2011, 2012, I was working in the commission, the DG INFSO in open innovation strategy and policy group. So in a way, this feels like a comeback. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miko. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and um, I, I move uh, directly to Marcel. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me uh, as well. It's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, interesting panel. Um, yes, I'm, I'm a professor at uh, Eindhoven University of Technology. I also originally studied here, but I did take a little detour. I did my PhD in Switzerland and I worked more than 10 years in Denmark, last five years in Copenhagen, but now sort of back uh, back to the roots, uh, back uh, back home doing um, 
uh, since last year doing mostly research and teaching in the domain of innovation and entrepreneurship in general, but also very much in the context of open innovation, which is my main research uh, interest. Um, for me, you know, open innovation is very much, you know, it's a distributed innovation process that sort of implies, you know, bringing together you know, different types of stakeholders. I think also, you know, linking to the introduction, my perspective often is on sort of how can organizations manage this kind of process. But I think the, the interesting, you know, frontier where we are is how does it link to indeed open science, open data and those kinds of developments. And how can we better understand how, you know, or not only organizations, but also individuals inside and outside of organizations and even entire ecosystems can really work together in order to solve some of the complex problems we face. And I think that is also specifically what we see in this uh, era, uh, you know, that we see, uh, you know, sort of new types of, you know, joint value creation. And, you know, I think the role of societal value in sort of the, you know, the development and activities within innovation ecosystems is really becoming more and more important, especially in this kind of context uh, of crisis and getting out of the crisis. So. That's also a little bit, I think, the viewpoint that I have and the perspective that I would br bring in, you know, what are the, the different types of innovation models that we can, uh, you know, develop in the context of such a crisis, getting out of the crisis, uh, try to address those kind of, you know, complex and uncertain problems, which I think it, to, to some extent is also unprecedented, you know, and can really offer valuable lessons for how we can tackle other societal challenges uh, in the future. We'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I finish Lima with you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure and honor to be in, in, in this very important event uh, for all Europe. And uh, um, yes, I'm director of Sunrise Valley Science Technology Park, just like Peter introduced me. Also, I'm a board member at the European Institute of Innovation and Technology and uh, co-founder of Clean Tech Cluster Lithuania and Sunrise Valley Digital Innovation Hub. Um, uh, very shortly, uh, what Neil, I have quite an experience in innovation policy creation. Also, um, for many years, I'm working in the field of business and science collaboration, building innovation ecosystem and communities, uh, enhancing the knowledge triangle of Sunrise Valley, which is the biggest in the Baltic countries, uh, talent, uh, science, business, and consequently, valorization-wise. Um, uh, the perspective uh, that I want to bring is uh, uh, that we can, uh, when we are united, uh, we can, science and industry. And during the crisis, uh, uh, these two sectors united their forces, their resources, uh, everything to tackle and solve challenges that so suddenly emerged and uh, so painfully struck our societies and our economies. And as a simple example of that is the COVID vaccine a year ago, you know, we, uh, we thought that we will have to wait it for a year and a half, but uh, uh, the successful collaboration of science and industry introduced the vaccine as a gift for us uh, just right before the Christmas. Um, and uh, this focused approach uh, could be applied towards uh, rapid valorization of research results in different areas, from uh, life sciences, biotechnology to traditional industry, education, or any other uh, uh, public uh, uh, or private sector and area of our lives. And uh, actually, it would be great if we would not need to wait uh, another crisis to understand, again, that open innovation, knowledge sharing is the key to successful valorization and uh, leads us towards uh, flourishing economies, uh, happy, healthy, and uh, resilient societies. Aima, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks uh, uh, indeed for highlighting the amazing vaccine success story. Huh? I mean, I find it all the more amazing if you allow me that um, it's in fact a European vaccine. Huh? BioNTech uh, is a European vaccine. Uh, the technology was developed, of course, over many, many years. And this is really a fundamental disruptive science, which is then leading to very direct applications. Uh, the, the founder of BioNTech, um, Hugo Sain, is, is just now, as we speak, uh, funded by the European Research Council. The European Investment Bank funded with 100 million in April the development of the vaccine. And then, indeed, there was, of course, cooperation also with a big American player, 
But at the outset, this is indeed a, a European success story of science combined indeed with innovation and with open science, because the, the, very, the very open sharing of data on the sequencing was also a key ingredient on the, the amazing acceleration of vaccine development, not just BioNTech, all of them, uh, of course. So thanks a lot, uh, Lima, for, for this first um, input. So let's uh, let's now uh, maybe go go a bit around the panel, and I will start with uh, Sasha and Miko uh, for both of you. And this was already in part in your opening statements, but maybe you can come back to it in a in a more specific way. Uh, maybe starting with you, Miko. Um, do you think that something has 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 fundamentally changed during the crisis, or that we will have uh, to change fundamentally? Out of the crisis um, in in um, in valorization. Um, same question to Sasha in a second, but Miko, why don't you start? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, now it, it seems uh, I start from a very big picture now, but but globally it seems that there are several systems and approaches to data and knowledge uh, uh, going on in the world. And and uh, another piece of advice uh, or advertisement: the foreign affairs published a theme issue on data a couple of years ago, and they identified four major systems in the world. There is the US system, which is very much commercially based on, on, on business companies. There is the Chinese system, which is very much control based. Uh, there is the European Union system, which is value based and which sets uh, uh, high standards for, uh, for instance, data protection. And interestingly, there is the fourth system, which is from India. And uh, the India system uh, is really putting uh, as a first priority the open infrastructure to all citizens. So, so, but if we look at this division, now we can see which of these systems, uh, uh, have, how these systems have operated during the crisis. And there are various results. And I think we have now an opportunity to look at these results and evaluate these systems, whether, whether there is something uh, that we need to pay attention to, whether, whether something seems to be working well and something maybe less well and, 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 and so on. But uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, first uh, approach that, uh, that I, would, I would like to uh, bring forward is, is really the, what we call a public-private uh, partnership. I think we need to have tools and, and practices to make this uh, public-private uh, partnership a reality and, and seamless operations between the public and private sector. Because our anal analysis in Finland and also in, in, in Nordic part of the Europe seems to uh, indicate that one third uh, of research is uh, publicly financed, two thirds are coming from companies. So this means that the, uh, uh, the more we see cooperation, the more we will have efficiency in this system. So I think that's an important uh, uh, question. And another question, uh, if I have time, uh, I will bring the so-called uh, fire brigade argument. So when the house is on fire, you need a fire brigade. You don't need the association of fire brigades. So I think that there is also a need to change the mode in a crisis and, and to be able to, let's say, uh, focus on uh, uh, very important uh, matters that come up and raised during the crisis, like in this crisis, COVID crisis, uh, uh, that we know exactly where the virus is moving and spreading. And, and to have this information and, and, and following at, at a very high level I think it's one of the lessons, and I, I'm, I must say that uh, uh, our friends in Asia probably were ahead of uh, the virus in, in many respects. So, so we have to pay respect to their system in this respect, and maybe take some lessons uh, from, from there also. Uh, uh, but maybe, maybe this is my kind of uh, starting comments. Thank you. 
muted each time someone comes in, I'm getting muted. Uh, uh, maybe you don't mute me, dear host, if you can, as, as the moderator. That would be appreciated so I can react a bit more smoothly. Domiko, thank you very much. Um, and um, I think, uh, in particular, your, your, your first point, I think, was particularly um, interesting. And I think uh, it would certainly be very valuable to, to see um, how the whole the different systems um, uh, with the European the European value based one, also of course with it with, with the connection that has on the capacity to interact properly between public and and private sphere, how impactful these uh, various systems have been in dealing with the pandemic. I mean, there are obviously very 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 many additional aspects which come into the equation, uh, and I think um, from a European point of view, uh, I think there's a lot which was uh, highly successful. Uh, but there's also there are also a number of elements so that indeed we we will need in the next month to do a, a serious taking, uh, including by seeing uh, across uh, all member states uh, where we've uh, been more efficient, where we've been less efficient, and then try indeed to draw lessons in, in terms of preparedness. Um, but what you're also saying is that uh, developments on knowledge valorization during the crisis were also carried in terms of accelerating trends huh, rather than totally new developments. I think. Sasha, over to you. I think you, you, you're still muted, Sasha. I don't know if we can unmute you. I can unmute myself. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, uh, just to build on what uh, Miku said, uh, obviously the crisis uh, was stimulating big time uh, the cross-border collaboration, cross-scientific, uh, cross-business uh, scientist collaboration, and this was uh, obviously one of the um, of the big uh, gain, if you want uh, this, and uh, the whole concept of. Uh, uh, open uh, platform-based um, uh, science collaboration systems for uh, co-creation uh, was stimulated. Uh, second thing was uh, obviously the democratization of the digital-based exchange and uh, the change habits of people to be online outside of uh, uh, their usual circles. And I'm mentioning this especially because uh, we are talking uh, today about innovation and research, but uh, that's very, very critical. Uh, what is the mental shift of people, uh, which obviously through program uh, was not necessarily so easy to, to happen. Coming back, uh, back to, uh, uh, to, to these uh, grassroots activities, which I did out of special attention to me, I want to give one example of uh, something that happened through the crisis that we eventually need to study a little bit deeper. Uh, in almost all European countries, uh, happened the grassroots hackathon hack the crisis where yeah. hundreds of uh, innovative projects were born uh, over the night, uh, has been uh, creative communities, and out of this, uh, as an outcome, came medical solutions, came uh, entrepreneurial solutions, uh, uh, and so on and so far, that already are formed as uh, uh, specific uh, practical projects and research projects. So eventually we should uh, find a way uh, to transport uh, even easier this energy into And uh, the third thing that I just uh, want to mention, which is an outcome of the crisis, is uh, the accessibility to top class experts, which uh, because people are not traveling, uh, they have a chance to be mentors, to participate in more events, and to shorten, if you uh, if you want, the link uh, uh, within the system. So yeah. that's uh, also something that uh, uh, I want to outline. Thank you. No, thank you, Sasha. Thank you very much. Your last point is, is particularly important. I think uh, this now uh, full, uh, full full capacity to interact in this hybrid or digital format 
is going to give access to so many more people uh, to key um, EU instruments or, or EU, yeah, 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 EU, EU based processes, which was not the case before. And the same goes the other way around, huh? uh, where EU actors will also have much more natural impact uh, and, and access rather than well, access and maybe hopefully with it impact into um, a national and uh, local ecosystem. So we, we really have um, an, an amazing capacity now to nurture that. I wanted to, to I also want to react briefly on your hackathon. I think this is indeed uh, has been a very spectacular uh, moment, particularly between uh, April and, uh, and the summer, a little less afterwards, because of course, many of the crisis uh, needs were, were then managed uh, a little more, a little more uh, classically, but what then also happened, as you as you know, Sasha, is that there was this European hackathon, which built, was which was built on all these national events, and what then was done also uh, is we organized what what was called a matchathon, where we put together the these hackers and their solutions with uh, hospitals, um, health managers, uh, industries, and out of that, uh, indeed, a number of solutions. Uh, could be deployed. That was done particularly with the European Innovation Council. And I think we will certainly also want uh, to take stock um, uh, when we are after the crisis to see uh, how many good stories indeed um, were fully deployed so we can then also draw the lessons from those. Great. Thank you very much. Now I turn uh, Lima and uh, and Marcel to you. So not so much the, the lessons per se, but uh, where do you think uh, the crisis has shown you that we really need to step up um, in Europe in terms of our, um, I mean, maybe culture, instruments, approaches to knowledge valorization. Where, 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 what is your advice to us uh, looking at the crisis? Laima, do you want to start? Okay. Um, well, uh, to, to improve uh, the knowledge valorization in Europe, I think uh, that the First thing is that uh, we need to ensure a better link between industry, academia, and research. And uh, many ideas from academia are not translated into actual products or services and businesses due to lack of uh, transfer mechanisms. Uh, sometimes um, SMEs would say uh, overwhelm bureaucracy or even uh, some negative approach. And um, uh, unfortunately, but this issue is uh, of e even more grave in other countries uh, that are with the lower innovation capacities. But uh, as a great example of uh, uh, bridging, uh, of creating a bridge uh, between science and industry, I would uh, uh, mention the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, which is doing precisely that. Uh, it is developing a pan-European networks, and it brings uh, business, uh, higher education, and research organization into so-called knowledge and innovation communities together. And uh, this model provides the framework uh, for a bottom-up co-creation process, and uh, it happens with industry, academia, stakeholders on the ground. Uh, and uh, they are involved in innovation activities since the very beginning, which is very important. And exploitation is embedded in the innovation process. Uh, so uh, perhaps to summarize uh, what we need for better knowledge valorization, I would say create linkages, nourish innovation ecosystems, lower bureaucracy, and uh, raise awareness and positive attitude toward uh, scientists within businesses and vice versa, entrepreneurs within science. Very clear. Thank you very much. Marcel, what about you? Where do we need yeah. to step up? Yeah, well, I think the first uh, first step would be also to take a step back uh, in a way. Uh, of course, I'm talking as a, as a researcher. I'm, you know, I'm interested also in this kind of, you know, in the phenomena and the processes behind it. I would say, you know, if we take a step back, you can see this, you know, the, the crisis also as a type of, a, you know, like a, it's, it's one of a grand societal challenge. Um, which I think is important to view it in that way as well, um, because I think, you know, in that sense, it, it inherently, you know, has a lot of, you know, complexity and uncertainty in it. So it's a particular type of problem that is, of course, very large, complex, uncertain, very also systemic, that also, you know, requires fundamentally different solutions, where we need, you know, much more open and collaborative approaches, you know, across different organizations, uh, across university industry boundaries, 
involving uh, citizens in, uh, to some extent uh, as well. Um, and, and I think that is really, you know, the first step, you know, to take a step back and try to understand, you know, what that, you know, how we can, you know, better conceptualize, you know, those kinds of processes in order to move to the next step, which is, of course, addressing them. And that's particularly from a knowledge valorization point of view, very important. Uh, but, uh, you know, but then the next step would be uh, to, 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 you know, based on the more detailed understanding of, okay, how do these processes work? How can we understand, you know, the complex challenges? What kind of solutions have been developed? Uh, I think that is really critical. I think the, the hackathon, you know, EU versus virus one is a, a very relevant example where you see to some extent, uh, you know, also you know, fundamentally different ways of organizing that are, you know, hold very important lessons for the future. It's indeed one of the examples that I'm also studying with, with colleagues to try to better understand, you know, how, how can we sort of take lessons from this um, in order to other, understand also the generic, you know, innovation processes that underlie such an initiative, which I think then has very important implications especially because that is more on the applied side of you know the type of research that I would do because it has direct implications for actually solving those kind of problems so understanding uh, and addressing you know the, this kind of complex problem I think should go hand in hand and that should be the next step I think also in terms of really addressing them in the future yeah and Marcel, Marcel and Lima, thank you thank you very much for, for that um, and indeed I mean on the on the hackathon I think one and this is very much bottom up. Huh? So one, I think one of the questions is, uh, w were the organizers at national level and then um, ourselves with your help at EU level, were we able to find the right actors? I mean, was this available to, to, to all those which could really contribute? Did we have the right teams to come together? Were we indeed able to then uh, identify what the, the solutions which really were, and in, in a very fast flow, huh? uh, the solutions which were really um, relevant and, and and also to a degree of maturity but this is also where i think um, the the moving it then to the uh, matchaton uh, stage i think is really the, the the key step both in terms of filtering but also in terms then of valorization i think this is also something which um, you, you might want to look at i'm sure you will great um, uh, i think we are now already moving quite a bit in time so we had a second prepared round, but if you agree, um, dear panelists, I think I will now move to the slider questions, uh, which we have in the chat, which are really good. Huh? Uh, so, um, um, and, uh, and they are also, in, in most cases, addressed to one of you. So I think I'm going to uh, simply do that. And I think, Miko, I start with you. Let me just see if I can find the question again, because I moved up. That's not very smart. Uh, pop, 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 uh, voila. Uh, so, Miko, I don't know if you can see the question, so I'm going to read out yes, to for everyone in any case. If knowledge of valorization is not just about money, it's also about money, honestly, but if it's not just about money, uh, what you, do you think should be the key indicators to check where, whether we are doing well in value creation from knowledge? Miko, do you want to have a go at that? Yes, okay. So, uh, I think... Um, uh, of course, the simple answer would be to look at uh, what happens on the innovation side and, and monetarily and so on. But I, I think this is uh, uh, not the question. Uh, but but uh, uh, I'm a firm believer of uh, uh, ecosystemic development and putting people together and, and having cross sections of different uh, scientific approaches and also the companies. Because uh, uh, one thing we have noticed this is that the Business companies, when they work in the field, so to speak, they may run into issues and problems that are not known to the scientific community. And mm -hmm. the scientific community benefits very much of this type of cooperation because they get more information from the field and more material to work with. So, so basically, I, I do believe that if, if you would have an indicator that would be following the amount of these cross-sectional projects, uh, they could be uh, from different parts of the European Union, from different scientific uh, fields, different industrial fields. I believe that this, this might be uh, doing the trick, so to speak. And, and one thing which I like to uh, bring up also is the, the uh, digitalization issue. We have been talking about digitalization as a general concept. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, I, I think during the past two or three years, we have seen that what really starts to happen is digitalization or data in medicine, digitalization in climate control, digitalization in energy uh, uh, development and fuel development and so on. So, so uh, digitalization becomes one of, of the piece in a cross-sectional uh, uh, kind of uh, meeting of minds, so to speak. And, and, and I believe in this type of, of, of putting things together. And, and somehow I also believe that this is very much to the core of the concept of open innovation. That's really interesting. Uh, um, I mean, on, on, of course, connecting science um, uh, and digitalization, I think this is very much the deep tech innovation rate, which we are now dealing with, and where I, I would argue, um, and, uh, and maybe all panelists can confirm that, uh, that Europe is particularly well placed huh, uh, in many aspects, huh, including because of our, of our scientific um, uh, excellence and also uh, our research organizations. Uh, Mikko, uh, let me just check whether I understood you correctly, because I found this also quite interesting. So what you're essentially saying is that you need to have uh, uh, places where the problems of industry uh, come up, allowing then um, scientists or engineers or combination of uh, uh, data scientists, engineers and, 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 and scientists to then uh, identify solutions. I mean, this is what research organizations do on a, on a, in a bilateral setup largely. But what, what, what could be maybe an interesting idea, and maybe air to the um, European Research Organization Association, which brings together uh, all Europe's great research organizations, um, Finland, Netherlands, uh, all of Europe, maybe we could organize a, a, an industry problem hackathon, no? uh, or, or matchathon maybe rather, identifying the yeah. problems and then seeing whether teams across research organizations could have interest in tackling them. That's an interesting, um, that's an interesting concept, which um, I'm sure my teams will will note. Thank you, Miko. I move yeah, to, you. to you, Marcel. I, I take the order of the questions, uh, dear, dear panel members, if you agree. So um, you mentioned joint value creation. Um, and the question is, do you have examples of uh, successful measures to promote interrelations in innovation ecosystems? So, I mean, how do you make ecosystems uh, fruitful, I think is the question. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, of course, well, I, th I think you can approach the, the question from a, a few different angles. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to answer it. You know, not with very specific examples, maybe, but also kind of more in a generic uh, sense. Um, because indeed, I think you know, innovation ecosystems are very much about you know joint value creation. That is the ultimate sort of objective of the entire ecosystem, where indeed you have multiple stakeholders who have certain you know interdependencies, uh, but also have their own interest, of course, uh, in in capturing part of the value that is jointly uh, created. I mean, that is like the definition of an innovation ecosystem, as I would put it. Um, now, if you think of ways of, of promoting the interrelations, um, the way I would look at it is very much um, about having to align different, say, uh, uh, levels of analysis, you know, in, in the entire system. Um, because in the end, it all comes down to how things really fit together. Because, of course, uh, an ecosystem on the one hand is, you know, typically part of some sort of, you know, regional uh, setting of some kind. So in that case, you need, for example, the support also from the policy level to make sure that sort of those conditions are shaped for those interrelations to develop. But then, of course, it trickles down very much to the organizations and uh, any stakeholder that is involved in the ecosystem. Um, and then it's very much about what are maybe the, you know, the uh, the, the the business models of the particular uh, organizations. Uh, what is the um, you know the the organization structure and the organization culture and those things that really allow you to build those bridges between the different organizations that are part of the ecosystem. Um, so in that sense, I think you know it's really about uh, shaping those relations. Uh, you know can be. Uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, trust-based. It's about what kind of capabilities do you have as individuals working for different organizations to be able to connect uh, across those different um, uh, organizational boundaries. And of course, in line with a kind of a leadership 
uh, within the different you know, organizations, but also for the ecosystem at large. Now, I mean, I think those are some sort of generic, uh, you know, ex um, sort of examples. I mean, I think there are, of course, more interesting or uh, they're interesting, more concrete examples. And I think, you know, Eric, you mentioned like a few countries and so on. So, I mean, why, why, one reason why I like moving back to the Netherlands uh, last year uh, is also that, you know, it's the, 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 the brain port region that I'm now part of, sort of the innovation ecosystem around the Eindhoven uh, um, area. Uh, which I think is a very interesting example where you see, you know, the initiatives across those different levels on the, you know, on the national policy level, regional, of course, the organizations that are part of it, and then how, what kind of implications it has for, you know, in, in individuals. It's very much a trust-based uh, system as well. Um, so I, I think we still have many, you know, questions how that really works. Uh, so uh, I'll be working on on those, of course. But I mean, those would be some sort of elements that I think are, are really uh, relevant to consider. Yeah, no, no, great. Thank you very much, Marcel. And I think uh, uh, the example of the Eidhoven region, where I, 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 I heard once that you claimed that you have the greatest concentration of brains per square kilometer in Europe and maybe worldwide. I'm sure there are other uh, very, very densely um, populated uh, Valleys in Europe, and I think um, indeed the, the 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 value of an ecosystem is indeed in this concentration largely, and this is why so so many were historically um, attracted to the Silicon Valley. But what I observe now, um, and I'm very I must say very impressed by that, is that you have more and more Europeans which don't go because they have exactly the same thing with a better quality of life in Eindhoven, um, uh, in Vilnius. Um, in, in certainly in Helsinki and uh, and uh, Sasha probably also in in Sofia and um, the question the next question is now for you um, it's a very direct question I find but it's it's, it's a good one um, and maybe you 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 can tell us whether during the crisis this was uh, more more obvious than uh, than generally and the question is are Bulgarian young innovators happy to sit at the policy table and maybe I would add do you think that they have some impact at that policy table. Um, actually, uh, I've just uh, to, to address also your previous comment, uh, also Sofia is quite attractive uh, for many um, nomads, innovators. Uh, uh, we have a small hub where uh, it is a societal innovation place. We have French people, we have Italians, and those are people that came because they are project that uh, they uh, want to be part of. It's a truly European open space of innovation that uh, uh, we experience also here in Sofia as one of the uh, good uh, uh, growing hubs. Uh, but uh, to the direct question, uh, my direct response is, uh, uh, yes and no, and I will illustrate uh, and I will share what I mean. Uh, the the uh, young innovators obviously are intrigued primarily on uh, uh, building their own companies or experimenting and making a research, but being part of an uh, innovation ecosystem, uh, and uh, some of them uh, decide uh, to really uh, spend some time and to summarize the needs and the requests of the community and uh, introduce them to the policy makers. And um, uh, they sit on the table, uh, but we should be uh, also understanding where they come from. Uh, they, those guys are missionary driven and they would do it only uh, if this uh, is the collective voice of the community that they uh, want to um, to I illustrate, and uh, that's why they would uh, sit with the policymakers. If policymakers invite them, uh, they would uh, check if this is something that serves the community. And uh, th that's why it's, uh, uh, there is a need to be very honest and to be very impactful when talking to these people in accordance to make them part of it. And uh, I will just illustrate this with uh, something that we've started at MoveBG, because uh, the Bulgarian government was not very open in uh, preparing the recovery and resilience plan. We uh, decided to put together a grassroots uh, initiative and we brought together the uh, innovators and the green organization and uh, we made uh, 
recommendations and so on. We even put together a textbook for uh, history of the future. I will send you an information. Here, the young guys, uh, they have been very actively part of it, putting together initiatives, uh, programs. They really was involved in this uh, policy, um, uh, let's say, for the future uh, process that uh, looks into the future, being responsible for uh, where they want to be. So we want to have them uh, on the table, not only in Bulgaria, but also on a European level, and they are ready to be there and to spend time. But we just need to find a way to speak in a different language to them. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sasha. And, and this notion that um, the young innovators or, or, or many scientists also, I think, uh, are driven also by, by policy purpose and values, um, and that, that we as policymakers need really to tap into it, because you recognize it, but also tap into it is, I think, very strong. I'll come back to that in, in my closing in, in a short moment. Uh, I, will, I will move to the closing, but before that, uh, Laima, one last um, slide question for you. Uh, I mean, we covered that to an extent, but I think it's it's good to come back to it. Uh, what in your experience, and indeed the, the Baltics are becoming, um, generally, you said it, huh? they are becoming innovation tigers in Europe. Uh, there are more and more amazing examples um, across all three uh, Baltic countries. And uh, what kind of incentives um, have you seen work best to boost this um, knowledge diffusion between science and industry? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Eric. Uh, well, really, let's come back. I think networking is one of the uh, key factors that helps to to uh, uh, combine forces of business and sciences, and uh, and uh, that helps to valorize research results. And of course, uh, some small measures like innovation vouchers that helps to uh, very fast to test some results and to to bring it to the market. And um, uh, the measures, like, like uh, were mentioned several times today, uh, hackathons. Actually, we were organizer uh, among the organizing team of the national hack the crisis hackathon. And uh, like uh, Jean -Eric, like you said, uh, that uh, matchathon is also very important because after hackathon, lots of ideas just well they just stay in the shelf, and matchathon helps to bring them forward. And uh, very interesting that you said uh, that it would be good to organize the industry hackathon. Actually, we had a series of industry hackathons in Baltic and Scandinavian countries at the beginning of this year. It was uh, um, a hack for industry 5.0 and mm -hmm. why. 5.0, because when we talk about uh, um, a transformation, a digital transformation of traditional industry, uh, we must think about uh, it um, on the approach of human-centric. And again, why Europe becomes even better uh, than Silicon Valley and United States, because we think about people. Uh, this is very important for us. Thanks. Well, Laima, thank you for that. I can tell you that Peter, who is listening in, Peter Droll, is going to be delighted with your last comment. So, uh, the, about this notion of a human-centric industry. And this, I think, is very much indeed a, a concept which is gaining ground. And as you rightly just said, um, positions Europe in a different place huh, than, than, than our partners and competitors around the globe. And that's perfect introduction for, for, for the last round. We of one minute each, one minute each if, you, if you manage, because we are now uh, getting to 11. And that would be, um, I mean, if you take a step back from the crisis, look at what we've learned, um, what do you think positions Europe particularly, and I think um, the notion that um, we are looking at um, a green transformation and that many innovators are really wanting to innovate to allow that, I think is for me at least one dimension, but you, you, you can echo it or, or cover another one. What positions us particularly? And um, uh, and maybe also, um, if you want to share one idea on whether you think we can also still um, pick up from other innovation systems across the world uh, to, to, to develop uh, an even more impactful innovation system. So a step back from the crisis, where's our key strengths and maybe where can we still pick up one from other ecosystems? And if you can do that all in one minute, and to Lima, as you kicked it off, why don't you also start this last round? If that's okay for you. You, you must unmute still, Lima. Thank you. Sorry, do you hear me now? No, you, no, you don't. Okay. 
Yeah, it's very difficult to step out of the crisis because, well, we are still um, getting out of it little by little. But, you know, crisis come and go. Uh, and we must take all the lessons from it. And uh, during this crisis, uh, business and science demonstrated that uh, rapid valorization is a key to tackling global societal and economic challenges. And without close collaboration, a culture of openness, it would not be possible. So I would say let's keep on the momentum of being focused, but staying open to all the opportunities. Great, Naima, thank you very much. And, 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 and all the very best for your, for your work um, in, in, in Vilnius and with uh, your Latvian um, uh, Baltic and Scandinavian partners. I, I move to you, Marcel. Yeah, I mean, I would say that basically uh, in Europe we have the right conditions, uh, you know, for for doing open innovation, open science, uh, and 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 do it well, considering both the sort of human side of the story and the more societal uh, impact side of the story. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also easier said than done. I think we really need to align all those different levels, as I mentioned before, policy level, the organization level, and the individual level, for example. And I think this is also where the challenge lies, but of course also the opportunities. How can we really align you know, those different aspects across those different levels? And I think then we really have a great chance uh, um, you know, to, to, to develop sort of the, the large European uh, ecosystem that consists of multiple smaller ecosystems, of course, and going forward into the future. Thanks, Marcel. I mean, indeed, not e easier said than done, but possible. And the and the capital investment, so to speak, to really get these uh, connections going is not so not so deep. And so everyone can really do it. And I see this in, in, in I must say, across all all your member states. Thank you very much, Miko. For you now, uh, you, what's your what's your, your parting comments? Okay, thank you. So uh, I would cite the former CEO of Nokia, uh, Jorma Hollila. He said that if you get three good news in a row, there is a fire somewhere that nobody knows about. So <laughs> there is a crisis uh, behind the corner somehow. But now I believe that after the COVID, we have some time to 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 really do the kind of benchmarking. Where did we do well? Where did where do we need to develop? And I would say that the the flexibility, uh, uh, sense of urgency and speed may be needed in in in, in a crisis situations in the f future. And hopefully there will be time to plan ahead a little bit about this issues but as a strength i would say that the i would really uh, look at you uh, mr chairman the the strength is, is is really the european union commission the institutions so that we have the platform ready there is a form for cooperation that that we must simply very actively use thank you Miko, thank you very much. I'm not going to come to the last point, but um, agree with you. We, we have a heavy responsibility uh, as well. Great, Sasha, the last word is for you. Um, what is the strength of Europe, in my view, is that um, uh, we have uh, uh, this diversity under control, uh, or not under control, but in a synchronized way, because uh, We've managed throughout the years to build up, uh, if you want, a platform, because Europe can be looked also in this area, where we have uh, this distributed research and innovation center uh, uh, and uh, we uh, that are working uh, as a network, as a system in a synchronized uh, way by not uh, uh, taking out the authenticity, the cultural specificity, but rather building on this. And I, I think that uh, that's a unique asset that Europe has, and uh, we are ready to, uh, through different instruments, to build on this. And what is a great opportunity before us, because uh, we can look in this crisis as a, a good uh, preparation, if you want, uh, for, the, um, for the climate crisis, which is uh, potentially more damaging than the uh, pandemic uh, from COVID. And if Europe manage through the Green Deal agenda, through the open science agenda that we are discussing uh, here, uh, through the uh, um, uh, really, I think we are best equipped uh, uh, than anyone in the world uh, um, in Europe uh, to uh, really 
formalize, if you want, the practices, the lessons of uh, us working in a collaborative, open uh, way into addressing uh, crisis effects, uh, Europe uh, uh, will have uh, uh, really leadership role in uh, this multi uh, power uh, world where, uh, if you want, the competition for economic leadership uh, is uh, quite strong at the moment. Uh, so I think that uh, we from the innovation research uh, uh, community can uh, contribute to this, but Europe is, in my view, best position at the moment, if we manage to take advantage. Sasha, thank you so much for that very positive uh, last note, um, which, uh, with which I obviously want to concur. Uh, dear panelists, thank you very much for uh, a, a very dynamic exchange. Uh, I hope we had many ministers listen to, listening to you, because of course there were not ministers in the room, but there were, I hope, many colleagues listening to, to this exchange, because we have, uh, I think, uh, here really made the case that there is a, a, a lot of capacity, a lot of energy, a lot of actors and ideas, and that indeed with um, Europe having a clear direction uh, around the green and digital transformations, uh, this really is a, a particularly a powerful factor in getting um, the communities um, and ecosystems which you are building up everywhere in Europe together. And with instruments like the EIT and the KICS, like the EIC, uh, we can certainly um, at EU level uh, allow that to, to, to get to critical mass distributed, but critical mass and make a deep impact. You can count on the Commission uh, to make knowledge valorization um, a, a continued obsession. For me, uh, the, the teams here in DG Research and Innovation and in the Commission, they are about providing knowledge and solutions to society, uh, to policymakers, to industry, to achieve this uh, recovery and these transformations. So it's centered around knowledge valorization, and I would like to thank uh, here Peter uh, and his entire team, KSA and colleagues, for this first um, uh, knowledge valorization week. Uh, there will be more to come so that we can ensure that indeed um, these solutions are effectively and deeply deployed. Merci à tous, thanks to all of you, and I wish you a good end of day, and then I hope a nice weekend to many of you. Keep safe, keep healthy. Thank you. Thank you.